Hello, welcome back. In this video, we're going to finish the remaining topics in Chapter 2, which includes income recognition and income taxes. There are generally three approaches to recognize revenue. In here, I want to um, really emphasize that we are talking about revenue and not um, net income. So the first approach is to recognize revenue when a firm actually receives um, cash or accounts receivable or a transfer of asset. So um, this is probably the most um, conservative way to recognize revenue. The second approach is when there is changes in the value of the asset or liability. And that is also considered a revenue. Um, so if your firm uses a fair value or if the of gap requires you to recognize the fair value, then the current market value uh, will be important to take into account. And the last approach is a hybrid of the others. And uh, we're going to go over an example of each one of these approaches. So in this example, let's say a company, Walmart, acquired a piece of land in 2018 for $100,000 in cash. At the end of the year, the, value, the market value of the land has gone up by $50,000. And then in another year, the value of the land went down. So this is not unusual for a piece of property's market value to, um, to change over time. And then finally, um, four years later in 2020, the company sells the land for $180,000 in cash. So let's take a look at how the three approaches um, can be used to evaluate this sequence of events. The first approach is that we only change the valuation when there's actual changes in assets, meaning that there's a transfer of exchange of cash for land and then later on land for cash. So in this case, when the land was acquired in 2018, we will recognize that we pay $100,000 cash for a piece of property. And then later on, um, the change in value would not, uh, the change in market value would not take in, would not get, would not be uh, recorded. But then when the company sells the piece of land, then you'll recognize that you receive $180,000 for the land uh, in cash. Um, but we acquired the land for $100,000. So we will recognize the revenue or gain of $80,000 at that point in time. So this is approach one. For approach two, we're going to recognize the change in market value. So the first transaction is the same. The company purchased the land for $100,000 in cash. But then at the end of the year, remember, the value of the land went up by $50,000. So we recognize that the market value has gone up by $50,000. And we also recognize the gain on fair market value. But then the value of the land went down from 150000 to 120000 So we recognize a loss of $30,000. And the value of the land, we also adjust it to reflect the current market value. So now the piece of land went from 100000 100, to uh, 150000 And now the value went down, back down to 120000 And then when we sell the land, we receive $180,000 in cash. The land, the current value, market value, as recorded in the book, was $120,000. So our gain was recognized as $60,000. So the amount of gain will change depending on whether or not the value of the land was reevaluated during the life of the, uh, the asset was held by the firm. Now let's look at approach three. So he, the last approach, we will value the land at current market value. And we'll also include any accumulated unrealized gain and losses. So let's take a look at how we'll do that. Once again, the first transaction is the same. We have $100,000 and we spend $100,000 in cash to get a piece of land. 
and then we realize the gain uh, or unrealize the gain. So this is this is put into other comprehensive income. So we change the value of the land, but this does not go through the income statement, but rather go directly into uh, the equity account. The same is true for the losses. We recognize it as unrealized um, gain or losses. And then when we sell the piece of land, we have, again, we get $180,000 in cash, the value of the land, uh, but we also have an unrealized um, gain because we have unrealized uh, gain of $50,000, and then when the value went down, we reduced that by $30,000. So we have an unrealized gain in our other comprehensive income. Uh, the land itself, the value is still $120,000. And the gain is $80,000. So that's, um, and, and this is the third approach to recognize revenue. Which approach a company choose to use, obviously, is up to the firm uh, in accordance with GAAP. And uh, what we want to do in, um, from a user pers perspective is to look at which approach give us the most information. Uh, in this particular example, approach three give us the most information. Right? It give us the, uh, at any point in time, we're able to assess the current market value of the land. Um, versus approach one, where we only have the land value $100,000, and then we sold it for $180,000. So if you look at any point in time, we do not, um, we don't have a good picture of what the actual value of the land is. Uh, approach two um, recognizes the revenue, the gain and losses directly into the income statement. So it affects the the income of the firm. Um, but those are actually um, um, unrealized, meaning that the company did not receive cash or lose cash uh, for the change in the market value of the land. So in this particular example, it isn't true for everyone, but in this particular example, approach three um, allow us to have a good idea of what the current market value of the land is, as well as allow us to understand that there were unrealized gain or losses um, and then when the final sale happened we saw the um, the gain uh, that is based on the actual pr original purchase price and the selling price so in this particular example approach three give us the most information as with um, so in this class I emphasize um, the focus is not so much on preparing the statement but rather understanding the information value and the information content of a of the financial statements next let's take a look at income taxes um, this is another area where um, there are um, a lot of nuances um, that is not as obvious when you just look at the financial statements. Uh, first of all, there are two types of reporting. There is financial reporting and there is tax reporting. Financial reporting follows US GAAP. So when do you recognize revenue? We need to follow the principles. Uh, the same is true for expenses and of course, revenue minus expenses give us income before taxes. However, uh, when we look at income tax expense, or more commonly uh, depicted by provision for income taxes, uh, we get net income. But when we look at tax reporting, uh, revenue recognition is driven by tax rules. And as most companies, we will try to minimize the amount of tax that we have to pay. Uh, the same is true for deductions. Deductions uh, very, very often almost always do not match expenses as stated by GAAP. So the tax rule deductions are more often than not different from um, expenses as reported by GAAP. So taxable income is technically could be different from income before taxes. So if you look at financial reporting income before tax and the tax reporting taxable income, these two amounts may not be the same. 
and based on taxable income, we compute the amount of tax that we owe the government. So very important to recognize is that taxes owed do not equal to income tax expense because the two rules are not the two sets of rules are the same are not the same. US GAAP and Internal Revenue Code in the United States are not the same. Uh, some of these differences we say are temporary and some are permanent. And we're gonna take a, a look at example um, at what happened when uh, if when we re, um, reconcile these differences. In this example, a company's income tax return shows $50,000 of income taxes owed. So this is the cash that we have to pay the IRS. But for financial reporting, the firm has both deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. So this, uh, we talk about the temporary and permanent portion. So the firms typically carry both deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. In this particular case, the firm has deferred tax assets at the beginning of the year of 42,900 and 38,700 at the end. So its deferred tax assets decrease during the year. We're gonna look at two scenarios. In the first scenario, deferred liabilities all, uh, increases. So let's take a look at that. In this case, uh, deferred tax liability increase from 28,600 in the beginning of the year to $34,200 to the end of the year. And the accounting for the entry is as follows. Um, the first set of entries are the same for both scenario. We owe the IRS $50,000 and our deferred ta tax assets decrease. Um, so it decreased by $4,200. So that will uh, be countered, that, that will reduce our equity. Um, in this case, we have an increase in deferred liability. Um, so liability went up. So that means that um, we also have a change in deferred liability and that increases um, our total income tax expenses. And the income tax expense, this is what will be reported in the financial statement. So this is what we actually pay the IRS. So this is the cash flow. Um, this is what we will report in the financial statement. In the second scenario, we have a decrease in deferred tax liability. Um, it, it went uh, from 58,600 in the beginning of the year to 47,100 at the end of the year. As noted, the first part is the same uh, under both scenario. Uh, we owe the IRS $50,000. Our deferred uh, tax assets um, decrease. Um, but then our deferred tax liability in this case also decrease, which offsets um, our income tax expense. So even though we pay the IRS $50,000, um, our reported income tax expense in this case is only $42,700. How big these differences are depends on the individual company. So it is important to dig deeper than just looking at the income tax expense. It is important to take a look at how much deferred tax, tax assets and deferred tax liabilities a company has on its books. Um, there are other area of income tax that may affect um, your interpretation of the values on the financial statements. Um, so first of all, um, so the other places that um, tax related information may be included um, are discontinued operation um, because this op discontinued operation is reported as a totally separate segment uh, under US GAAP. And then the other is other comprehensive income. There are many things that go into other comprehensive income and it's really worth uh, digging in deeper to find out what are there. So for example, we talk about in earlier unrealized changes in the market value. Um, so all these um, instruments, either debt securities that are available for sale or they are hedging instrument, um, especially if they are classified as cash flow hedges. Translation is another very big item. 
and then also uh, pensions and um, employee benefits. So when you are looking into doing analysis, uh, some of these could, um, you may have um, trouble reconciling between the income statement and the statement of cash flow, which we'll talk about later on in this class. Um, that is oftentimes the reason. Income tax reporting, translation, and items in other comprehensive income. Those are most likely the reason why um, it is difficult to reconcile between the two. Let's take a look at a real life example. Let's use Nike. Um, first, let's take a look at year one. Income before tax. Um, this, is the, this is the income that is reported. Taxable income that is used to compute um, IRS-based taxes are not reported, so we don't know where it is. However, we can take a look to see what we were, uh, what is um, implied. So we know that uh, provision for income tax is $708 million uh, in year one. However, taxes payable, this is the current amount, is $674 million. Since the payable amount is less than the provision, the expense amount, we can infer that the taxable income that is reported to the IRS is less than the book income that is reported as income before tax. The reverse is true for year two. In year two, our income tax expense or provision for income taxes are lower than the payable amount. So we can conclude that taxable income in year two that we report to the IRS is higher than the income before tax that is reported on the book. The other thing that you want to notice is that in year two, Nike switched from a net deferred tax liability position in year one to a net tax deferred tax asset position. So that means they pay a lot more in cash for taxes relative to the amount that they're currently expensed on their book. Finally, the level of details may or may not be available uh, for a particular firm. So if you are looking at a, um, a publicly reported um, financial statements, this may or may not be available. But in this case, it is provided to you and you can actually see um, the changes in terms of what are the major changes that lead to um, the change of the net deferred tax, uh, tax assets and liability position. One very uh, common um, tactic that company uses is that they want to recognize deferred compensation early uh, so that they can write off more in tax um, in terms of um, uh, tax liability to the IRS. Um, the, the earlier you can claim any tax deduction, the more valuable the deductions are to the company. So you'll see that going on here. And oftentimes, this requires you to take into account other things that is going on with the company. And this is oftentimes disclosed in the management discussion and analysis section. Or you may need to bring in uh, news reporting. So for example, uh, we see there's a huge loss related uh, deferred tax liability related to property planning equipment that is likely have to do with an acquisition that Nike has done. Um, and it was a able to deduct a large amount of that acquisition. Um, but for financial reporting, the company has to recognize intangible assets. So it will face a deferred tax liability um, for this amount that is considered expenses waiting to happen um, in the firm. This Nike example shows us that there's a lot of wealth of information in um, every single line item in the financial statement. Now let's take a look at back at a, um, um, a bigger picture in terms of how do we go about um, evaluating financial statements that, um, that is particularly useful for valuation. We learn from the first thing in accounting that assets is equal to liabilities plus equity. Let's take a look further down in equity. What makes up shareholders' equity? 
shareholders equity has um, forming um, three main components. Contributed capital, this is how much um, shareholder put in all together. So this will be par value plus any additional paying capital. And then accumulated other comprehensive income. So these are income that did not go through the income statement. And then the last part is accumulated retained earnings. These are incomes that did go through the income statement. So changes in total shareholders' equity will then include any stock transaction, which will affect contributing capital. So any um, there will be new stock, stock repurchase, and so forth. Um, and then other comprehensive income. So that is what goes through in one in in any particular year. And then net income minus dividend. Of course, that is additions to retained earnings. So let's take a look at an example. So a company sells land for $800,000 in cash, and then it has to pay tax um, for the gain, and the, and the tax rate is 20%. The company originally purchased the, uh, the piece of land for $500,000. So on the income statement, we recognize a gain of $300,000, and 20% at $300,000 is $60,000. So this is a tax that you pay. So this is the, uh, so you recognize a gain of $300,000 minus $60,000 in tax. You have a $240,000 increase in net income. And the journal entry will be first, you have to ask, uh, you have to recognize the cash that you receive and then the, um, reduction in property of land, and then you have a gain of $300,000. Then you also have the tax that you pay, so it's cash of $60,000, and then this is also recognized as an expense of $60,000. So the net impact on the balance sheet will be $240,000, as we see in here. And changes in shareholders' equity should also be $240,000. So in summary, this is a very long chapter. Um, here are the things that you should be able to do. First is understand that there are um, um, oftentimes we will use multiple measurements to value both asset and liability. And always keep in mind what we want to do is to provide the most relevant and also representationally faithful information. So, and remember that there's sometimes um, contradictions or a tension between the two. Some informations are more relevant, but they are more difficult to be represented faithfully. Uh, you have to use estimate. Um, but then if you, Ignore that if you disregard information that you need to use estimation to obtain, then the information may become not as relevant. So changes in market value is a good example. And this point, I think most of you have um, a good understanding, particularly uh, this is where a lot of most of your other accounting classes are focused on is the relationship between the various financial statements. This part is um, in your tax class. You probably will delve into this in a lot deeper in terms of how the preparation is done and what the IRS rules are. Um, in this class, I just want to emphasize that there is a difference between the two sets of rules are very different. And therefore, oftentimes, it will be very difficult to completely reconcile between um, the income statement and the cash flow statements based on publicly available information. And finally, um, it is important to understand what happened in the income statement and how does that impact on the balance sheet. We'll conclude chapter two in here. I will see you again soon in the next chapter.